to Crosspoint Church. Uh, this week we had a couple of uh, uh, changes in residences. Uh, we had uh, Sharon uh, Mail brought up her mother from the Dayton Beaver Creek area, and she is residing at Birch Haven. And what uh, what wing is she on? Oh, Dogwood. Dogwood. So if you go into the main entrance and you say, where's Dogwood at? They'll, they'll show you. It's really easy to get around there. And then Dorotha, uh, she had been in the hospital this week, and she is out at Birch Haven at least for the next two weeks. Um, we'll see what happens after that. Uh, but she had been in the hospital, and uh, she had fallen a couple times. And nothing major when an 87-year-old person falls, it usually is, or can be traumatic, but thankfully she's uh, a good, strong woman, and she didn't break any bones or anything like that, so she uh, was able to go out to uh, Birch Haven at least for the next couple of weeks until they determine what's going on, and uh, we'll see what happens from there. But she is in Honeysuckle, which is really close, uh, you know, so... Uh, she's in H10, so if you would, I know that she would enjoy any cards or visits or anything like that, and, and if you wanted to go out while you're there, if you wanted to go out and see Sharon's mom, I'm sure she would appreciate that. Uh, coordinate that with the males, though, so, because she's never met us, and we don't want to confuse or frighten her, so that's why I said I would love to go out and see your mom, but I want to do that when you're there, so I don't walk into the room. Uh, you know, <laughs> I tend to have that reaction sometimes with people. So, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of new people. So that's yeah. This would be a good time to to do that if you want to go out and see her because she's getting kind of into used to seeing a lot of new faces. So uh, I'm sure that that would just be uh, a welcomed uh, welcome visit. So uh, today we're going to be looking at a uh, a series. Last week we talked about Christ's um, sacrifice on the cross, his death and resurrection. Today we're going to begin a series talking about his return um, uh, from the book of the beginnings of the book of Revelation. Uh, much of this book can be very confusing. I want to just uh, start out by saying that, that a lot of times pastors don't preach from this book because it can be very confusing when you just read it. Um, but it's well worth the struggle as you go through the book. As we go through this introduction to the book of Revelation, I want to encourage you to write down any questions you might have. Because if you go through the book of Revelation and you're like, okay, got it. You're a better theologian than I. <laughs> because this, the imagery that he uses, the language that he uses, the way he describes things, uh, is a lot different than the way we think and talk and write. So um, if you have any questions, I want, to, I want you to write them down. And when the offering plate goes around, just throw that in there. If you have, if you want to write those on your yellow cards, if you want a uh, piece of paper, whatever, you know, however you want to do that, convey those questions to me. Go ahead and, and uh, uh, put those down. And I, you know, this uh, the sermon series was actually suggested to me last week. Was you know, on, on one of the yellow cards. Hey, we'd like to hear a sermon series about this, about Revelation. I was like, okay, awesome. So um, I, I was excited to do this. Uh, so turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible, real easy to find. <laughs> um, and we're going to begin with the very first <coughs> chapter in verse 1. And I had, I actually have it, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, I do have it on the screen. The revelation from Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests, 
to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will be mourned because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, this is the only book in the entire Bible that gives a special blessing to everyone who reads it aloud. And anyone who hears it and takes to heart what is written in it. So I think pastors should <laughs> read from this book to church often because it's a special way, a special blessing uh, for, for people. Um, and it's the only one that does that. So from the very beginning of this book, we know that there's something different and there's something special in store for us within the pages of this book. John begins his letter with this invocation in which he calls down the blessings of heaven on the lives of the Christian brethren. The closeness of John's relationship with Jesus has combined with the blessed days of their physical earthly pilgrimage and has given him an understanding that could only be gained through years of experience. Remember that John was the only disciple who died of old age. All the other disciples were murdered. John lived and died a long life. You know, he he uh, was uh, uh, exiled on the island of Patmos, and he was an old man uh, when he passed away, unlike all of the other disciples. So, and, and that we infer he had a special kind of protection from God, because this was the disciple that in... This scripture is decide, uh, described as the one whom Jesus loved. So he had a special relationship with God, with Jesus. And uh, so that, that is evidenced in the fact that he was protected all his life. And he was exiled on the island of Patmos, but he was able to accomplish a whole lot. The love and thoughtfulness expressed by this mature saint revolve around the wondrous works of Jesus and his glorious return. The promise of Jesus' return fills us with the anticipation for it, uh, for he is the one who has begun the good work in us, and he will bring it uh, one day to its wondrous completion. So John uh, talks to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, this is one of the things that, that uh, starts off to be confusing. We're like, okay, seven churches in Asia, certainly there was more than that. Uh, seven spirits, what is this? What is, I thought there was just the Holy Spirit, so how did there become seven? Well, seven is a number of completeness or perfection in the Bible. Uh, the seven churches are representative of all churches. And we'll get to them in, in later uh, uh, sermons. But what they do is they represent a type of church. When he's talking about the church of Ephesus, or this church, or that church, he's, they represent what churches are like that are like that. You know, that uh, he talks about one church that's lukewarm. You're neither cold nor hot, and so I'm going to spit you out. Now think about it on a, on a nice hot summer day. You go in, and you get a nice refreshing glass of lukewarm water. What are you going to do? That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to spit it out because it's not refreshing. Yes, it's water, but it's not cold. You know, it's just not what you want. So that's what Jesus was saying about the church. You know, churches that are like this, and we all know churches that are like that. We pray that we're not part of a church like that, right? That where it's, it's lukewarm. They're not doing anything bad, but they're not doing anything good either. There's nothing going on. It's just kind of existing. And so they, they want to do something. They want churches that are on fire. So that's why Jesus uses them. He uses them as a representation. The message, therefore, is for all churches, including our church today. The customary greeting captures the richness of the Christian faith. Uh, grace represents the believer standing in unmerited favor or kindness before God. And peace represents the wholeness and well-being well that those right in right relationship with God experience. 
God, the source of all grace and peace, is the God of the present, the past, and the future, and is called the one who is and was and is to come. This designation reminds us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, we exist in this time frame today. There was a time that I wasn't here, <laughs> that I wasn't, you know, so I'm not the one who was, I'm the one who is, I'm not the one who is to come because I'm here now, but God was, is, and is to come. He's the same, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The world can undergo drastic change, but God never changes. This is why he can always be the source of grace and peace. The second blesser and giver of grace and peace is the Holy Spirit. Here he is designated by the seven spirits before the throne. It indicates a sevenfold fullness or a manifold work of the Spirit. Okay? Um, and the third blesser, uh, whom we find in, in verse 2, is Jesus Christ. For there is neither grace nor peace but from him. And from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The book of Revelation points to Jesus Christ and gives us a clear view of him. He is introduced with three pretty impressive titles. Uh, he is the one who has borne faithful and true witness, which was a favorite word of John's, to the world. It is his character, and he cannot be other than a faithful witness. All that we need to know about faith and life, he has revealed to us. He faithfully revealed God's word both during his earthly ministry and in this book of Revelation. He's also titled as the firstborn of the dead, uh, which is kind of a weird uh, title. Uh, but he's the first to receive a resurrected body, uh, which is immortal. He was the first to rise from the dead, and the title probably carries the idea of sovereignty. Uh, first of all, in position or place in chronology, it is Christ is first and others follow Christ in his resurrection from the dead. You know, all, all the righteous dead are included in the first resurrection in Revelation 20, we'll get to that. Uh, the wicked dead are raised after the millennium in chapter 20, verse 12, but again, we'll get to that later. Uh, most major religions in the world adore uh, some great but dead leader or philosopher. Christianity alone declares its faith in a living, resurrected Savior. A missionary was explaining this truth to some people. He said, I'm traveling, and I have reached a place where the road branches off in two directions. I look for a guide and find two men. One is dead and the other is alive. Which of the two should I ask for directions, the living or the dead? The people respond, the living. Then the missionary said, why do you follow a leader who is dead instead of Christ who is alive? If we believe in the actual physical resurrection of Christ, then we will have no difficulty in believing anything else in God's word. If we reject this central doctrine, we might as well throw away the entire Bible. If Christ is not risen, he has broken his promises, he has failed in his prophecies, and we are still in our sin. But because Christ lives, we will live. His witness and resurrection are past. Easter is over. <laughs> his fulfillment of the role as ruler of the kings of the earth is future. He will one day direct the affairs and the destiny of the, of the nations of the earth. He will be installed over all rule and authority after his victory over the beast and the false prophet in Revelation 19. But again, we'll get to that later. There's some pretty exciting stuff coming up. <laughs> Jesus is coming again to put the wrongs right and redress the uneven balance of this present world. For all of you who say, when are things going to be made right? You see the evil prosper and the good suffer. You're saying, when is this? This is not the way it should be. And God's saying, you're right, it's not. And one day, I'm going to send my son back to correct it. This is the day that we all look forward to, when all of the wrongs are made right, when everything is set back in perfect balance. My next point is Jesus' redemption in verses 5 through 6. It talks about that. To him who loves us 
and released us from our sins by his blood. Much of what we talked about in communion today. John now bursts into praise for Jesus' ministry for us. He proclaims Jesus is worthy because of three specific deeds. That he loves us, he freed us, and he made us to be a kingdom and priests. Jesus loves us and keeps on loving us in the present tense. Jesus loves us, uh, his love for us is in full force now as it was when he was delivered up for us on the cross. The breadth, the length, and the depth, the height of the love of Christ. Who can measure it? Who can comprehend it? It, is a, it encompasses us like a shoreless, bottomless sea. It's beyond our knowledge and thought. The love of Christ for the redeemed is a permanent abiding fact. There's nothing that you can do to ever make God love you less. Nothing you can do to make him love you less. This love has released us and freed us and loosed us from our sins. How was this wonderful uh, wonder of wonders accomplished? By his blood, by his death, in our place for our sins on the cross. Forgiveness and release was granted to those who will believe and appreciate it. The sacrifice of Christ that he brought us, uh, brought us freedom from the chains of sin that bound us and seek to bind us. The shed blood of Jesus looses us from our sin to serve God. In the 14th century, a man named Robert the Bruce, next in line for the Scottish crown, led the fight to gain independence from England. At one point in the conflict, the English were about to capture him. He escaped into the forest, so they put bloodhounds on his trail. When Robert the Bruce heard the dogs bang loudly as they closed in on him, he headed for a stream that flowed through the forest. He plunged into it, waded upstream for a short distance. Coming out on the other bank, he was now in the depths of the forest. Within minutes, the hounds had closed in on this, and tracing his steps came to the bank, but they went no further. The English soldiers urged them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent away. A short time later, the crown of Scotland rested upon the head of Robert the Bruce. The memory of our sins, prodded by Satan, can be like those baying dogs. But the stream flows red with the blood of Christ. If we trust Jesus, we never need fear of being condemned for our sins. Our guilt is gone forever because of Christ's blood. By grace through faith, we are saved. No sin hound can find us. The trail is broken by the precious blood of Jesus. There was a coal mining town uh, that was dotted with coal yards everywhere. One day a crowd was gathered in one of these storage areas to watch a rather humorous spectacle. The duckling was taking a bath in a basin. He bobbed his head and body into the water over and over again. And as he did, he was getting dirtier and dirtier because the water was full of coal dust. Finally, he overturned the basin and scampered away under a woodpile, black from all his efforts. It may be funny when a duckling tries to wash with dirty water, but when a person tries to wash away his sins, the result is tragic. God has provided his own cleansing method for sin, but many try to substitute the water of their own works. Through religious activities, these people go through the motions of spiritual bathing, only to find that their very best deeds cannot make them presentable to God. The stain of sin is not removed. Where can sin-defiled men and women find this cleansing? In the blood of Jesus, who died on the cross for all sin. To try some other way to depend on works or moral behavior is like washing in the coal yard's wash basin. By faith, accept the cleansing that God has offered, through the death of his son, the shed blood of Jesus is the only way to really get clean. I did a, uh, a youth service once where I was trying to explain this, how, uh, how difficult it is to get clean from sin. So I had all of you write down a sin that they struggled with on a piece of paper. And up front I had a five gallon bucket. And I said, I want you to put the sin the paper in this five gallon bucket so they dipped their hand into the mud <laughs> that was in this bucket and they placed it in there. I said, okay, now wash your hand. How can you wash your hand?
wash your hand without getting this mud everywhere, right? Somebody else had to do it for them. So I stood there with a pitcher of clean water and washed their hands for them so that they were able to then be clean. I said, it's the same way. We can't wash our own hands. We can't get that mud off our own hands without getting that sin everywhere else, right? You know, guys, how many times have our wives yelled at us because we've been out working on the car or working in the yard or something? We come in and our hands are filthy and we make a mess of the sink. We get our hands clean, but the sink is a mess now, right? And so, and I see all the wife making this face. Yeah. So, but we do that, and we, we make a mess of everything else. We have to have somebody else help us to get truly clean with that. And that's what Jesus offers us. Verse 6 tells us what happens to those who are changed by the shed blood of Jesus. And he has made us to be a kingdom and priests. To God his Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The glory brightens as the blessings continue. That we should experience the love of our Lord is wondrous. That we have been forgiven for all our sins at the cost of his own blood is almost too much to believe. Added to this, that we are a kingdom with the full prerogatives of royal priests. God's people are a kingdom not only because God is their sovereign, but because they participate in the reign of Christ. Here's one of the few places the church is called a kingdom in, in the Bible. Believers are a kingdom because they will fill the role of princes alongside a messianic Christ. Jesus has promised his disciples that they would share in his rule. In several different places, Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Luke chapter 22, verse 30, he promised that we would share in his kingdom. Believers are also priests to God. They have immediate access to the very presence of God where they perform the priestly functions of offering thanksgiving, praise, and worship to God. Right now we perform the priestly ministry of speaking to God on behalf of men and, and to men on behalf of God. We seek to reconcile men to God that they too might become a priest to God and be a member of God's forever kingdom. That's the one difference that we have, one of the many differences theologically, but one of the biggest differences that we have with the Catholic Church. A lot of uh, Catholics believe that you have to go to the priest to have him pray for you? Well, in Revelation, we're told that we are priests. We can go right to God. We don't need an intercessor to do that. We can go right to God. That's why we don't pray uh, the, the Hail Mary, to have her intercess to God on our behalf. We don't need that. That's one of the biggest differences theologically between ourselves and the Catholics. I'm not going to say that they're right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's a difference. And finally, Jesus' promised return in verse 7, he says, Behold, I am coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so, amen. You know what's interesting is that Church of the Ascension is, is on the top of the Mount of Olives. It's where Jesus ascended into heaven, and where it said that he will return again, right there, overlooking Jerusalem. You can see it for miles. And you can imagine... That, you know, and it's, it's almost, you can't help but do it when you're standing there looking up. You know, it's like, is, is it now? Is it, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> let's, let's do this, God. Let's come on back. You know, you're standing there in this church where he was, where he went up, and where he will return again. And it's, it's just kind of amazing that, that, that that's, and you can understand why everyone's going to see it. Because it's a very prominent place, high place around that region, and it's, you know it's going to be visible. Behold, or sense, or see, uh, announces a central theme again in this book, uh, the Revelation, or the second coming of Christ, which leads to the consum uh, consummation of all things in Him. Uh, so when this verse, verse 7, begins, behold, it was kind of like, Hey, I need your attention. You know, that's what he was, the writer John was saying. Pay attention to what follows next. It's like he put it in bold type. When you use that word, behold, 
it was, it's something stood out. Uh, so this is, he's coming in an emphatic form of declaration. As Christ was received into the cloud on his ascension, uh, he will again come from the clouds of heaven. On the days when the cumulus clouds fill the skies, I like to imagine that Jesus is coming through them. And he appears, and all over the earth persons will stare in amazement and shock to see him descend. Can you imagine? That's why thousands of, of people have had their, their uh, uh, burial plots right there. You know, down the Mount of Olives and up on the other side, there's thousands of graves. For that reason, they know that the Messiah is going to come back in this spot, and they want to have, it's just like uh, jostling in line for good tickets to a concert. You know, <laughs> they want to be right there, I want to be first in line, I want to be front row center, you know, I want to, I want to be able to see them, if that way if Jesus throws a guitar, a guitar pick, I get it, right? I'm going to be right there when, you know, somebody, and I'm going to be right there in the front, I want to, I want to experience it, that's what they do that for. Christ has is, is not gone to heaven to stay there, but to prepare a place for us. Remember John 14. If that's an important passage. I, you know, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. So that one day where I am, you may be also. So Jesus is preparing that place for us. And when the Father says it's our time, you know, then he comes back and gets us and takes us there so that we can be with him. So he left physically and he will return Physically, Jesus went to heaven with a physical body, and he will return that way as well. This incomprehensible truth of God acknowledged to the, in the church creeds is essential to the very life and substance of Christianity. Uh, let unbelievers murmur about it, dispute it, mock it, uh, despise it, and hate it, but it is as absolute as the gospel itself. Um, it's, this is uh, true just as Jesus himself is true. He comes with the clouds, that is, with great majesty and glory, with pomp and splendor. He who makes the clouds his chariot will come upon the wings of the wind. And every eye will see him, and the return of the Lord will be public, it will be visible. Uh, no one will be able to deny what is happening. You know, it would be like, oh, that's just an optical illusion. Oh, he's really here. <laughs> you know, it's like, ta-da. You know, every, everybody's going to see it. And there's going to be no excuses on that day for anything else, believing anything else. You know, oh, it's Jesus. Uh, yeah, I believed in you. Oh, really? You, you know, you said this was nonsense back on such and such a day. Well, I really didn't mean it. <laughs> you know, I mean, can you imagine giving Jesus an excuse? But people are going to try. That's why it says his return will, will bring mourning among the people because they'll realize. And I look, at, I look at what's going on in Jerusalem today, and I think there's going to be a lot of people there who are going to be mourning. You know, the, the Jews who don't believe, the, the Arabs who don't believe, who are making it hard for, uh, for believers to, to be you know, Christians there. I, I look at that and I go, wow, this is really going to, this is what it's going to be like. These are going to be the people who are mourning about this. It says all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. This will be a sad, sad time for many who will be brought to the full realization that they were wrong. They will uh, mourn not, uh, not reading and listening or heeding his word because it's too late for them to change sides. Their gaieties and pleasures will turn to shrieks and despair. Even those who pierced him will see him. Through his manifestation, it's universal and it has an awful impact on some people. There are those who have mocked Christ and disbelieved his offer of salvation. <coughs> Someday each and every one must be confronted by him and meet his all-penetrated gaze. For, from the man who pierced his side to those who made wounding, insulting comments concerning the meek Lamb of God, that uh, they sh shall be compelled to look upon him uh, whom they have pierced. <laughs> wow. Even so, amen. This, uh, though this will be the ultimate catas uh, catastrophe for billions of wicked, it must occur. It's a preciously long-awaited day for some, coveted and prayed for by all the saints of all the generations. 
That's why John says, Amen, or it is true, so be it. The last verse here says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. To all this, Jesus adds a most wonderful declaration concerning himself to further confirm the solemn truthfulness of the words just written and cause us to give greater stress to them. Great and difficult things were on the mind of Christ when he was going to give um, to the church or to assist them in preparation for his coming and for their coming to him, which should, uh, ever should come first. Christ desires uh, that they understand who is giving the message so that they would absolutely be certain of his accomplishment. Everything that Jesus said he was going to do, he did. And so he wanted to make sure that he stressed this so that they understood who, who it was that was saying them. So he invokes this title, the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It signifies the beginning and the end. He who brought everything into existence will bring it all to conclusion. Who is, who was, and who is to come. This title for the Father is also the title for his co-equal Son. He is the great I Am, whose being is the same throughout all existence. He alone is self-existing. He was before all time and brought all things into existence. He is in control even now as the nations and their demons rage. He will bring existence to its conclusion, for He is the Almighty. This name leaves nothing outside His power to control and to effect. He can do all that is just and right according to His standard of justice and righteousness, and nothing can stand in His way or hinder the accomplishment of His word or His will. Do you know that the largest type used by most newspapers for headlines or astounding events has been called the second coming type. These heavy black letters are reserved only for the most amazing front page news stories. This dramatic type has been used to announce the beginning and the end of wars, the moon landings, presidential election winners, natural disasters, and other significant events. One day mankind will witness the great event, which is the second coming type uh, was named, which is the return of Jesus. And what a day that will be. The one who ascended into heaven so long ago will return to earth. When our Lord comes back, it will be such a phenomenon uh, that uh, it will command worldwide attention. Behold, he is coming. It could be in the morning, it could be at noontime, in the evening or at night. Let us not trifle with his greatness or question his power. Let us come now to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his precious spilled blood. Let us rejoice for we are a kingdom and priests to the ultimate absolute sovereign. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his sacrifice for us, for his... Uh, for his love for us that brought him here to, on our behalf, to cover us and our sins with his precious blood so that one day we could stand before you innocent, not because of our own actions, but because of your son's love for us. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name.